Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue our study on the book of Esther. And uh, in connection with uh, understanding the role of Xerxes as Trump. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we open your word to receive light and strength and guidance. We just ask, Lord, that you can be with each person who is studying these things. Um, we pray for the meetings in Romania and, um, and uh, for George, who's going to be presenting there. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you can help him and his family. And we also ask, Lord, that as we continue to search the scriptures, that we can become uh, closer to you and closer to one another. We pray for this movement. And uh, we ask, Lord, that uh, the things that you are teaching us can be a benefit to all around us. Help us to reflect your character and be with us as we study together. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Now, um, I know the last couple of days have been a little difficult because we've been trying to sort through uh, apocryphal Esther and how to put, place this on the line to understand the order of events. And um, so it's it's not been the easiest thing for us to do. Now, we did study Esther in detail before, and I don't I don't want to go through all of Esther. Uh, but there are some points that we can look at that can help us understand uh, the role of Xerxes. That's the main point here. If is Xerxes as Trump. And um, what we can see is that the first three chapters represent the first, second and third angels messages. And we can place the pawn, place them upon a line in our history. And that's what we've been doing. But I want to touch on one little point. Um, we have in the story of Esther, we have this golden scepter that is is held out or laid upon her neck, as it says in uh, 5 verse 11 or, or 15 verse 11, connected with chapter 5. And I'm just going to um, do this here. Okay, so I know we're just jumping into this, but... Um, because in Esther chapter four, um, when she goes in before, uh, um, Xerxes, it talks about, um, that except such whom shall the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live, but I've not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. So this holding out of the golden scepter, this sort of acceptance, of Esther, I think has a prophetic import that we need to consider. I don't know what it is exactly. Um, and uh, I'm sure once Dwight gets here, he's going to have some things to say about that. But at this point, I'm just pointing it out. <clears throat> um, So you couldn't just walk in to see the king, but if you did, um, you would be put to death unless he holds out this golden scepter. So, so we need to consider that that symbol. And I'm not, you know, again, understand it in, in one way. You know, just you know, God's acceptance of us, His pardon. But to understand it prophetically, that's what I'm uncertain about now um so we have that um in esther chapter 5 verse 2 uh, it gives us this reference um so i think it's going to be and, and in esther 8 4 so in esther 8 4 it says the king held out the golden scepter toward esther so esther arose and stood before the queen or before the king, pardon me. Um, 
So on that day did King Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther the queen, and Mordecai came before the king, and Esther had told what he was unto her. The king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. And the king held up the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it please the king, if I have found favor in his sight and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman the son of Hamadath the Agagite which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come upon my people? Or how can I endure to see, see the destruction of my kindred? Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther, the queen, and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him have they hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Right. So then they're going to have Esther's decree, So, um, which is this sort of counter decree. Now we have, um, you know, Haman being hanged in chapter seven, uh, the king honoring Mordecai, right? So we know that whole story. So we're not going to go through each of these, um, except to, to note that there is this, this idea about holding out the golden scepter and, um, let my computer catch up here. Um, I don't know why it went there. Let's go there. Um, so, okay, I'm trying to see. So it doesn't give us the references. This is the treasure of scripture knowledge. Um, So you're going to see in here, which verse was it in? Uh, so this is in the Apocrypha. It says, so he held up his golden scepter and laid it upon her neck. And um, then you're going to have. Um, so if we look at Esther 5, 2. I'm trying to figure out how that works. I'm just going to go back to the King James here. Um, right, so you're going to have that. Um, the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So you're going to have that in 5-2, that that occurs. Um, and, and then it's going to happen in 8-2. Verse four. So there's going to be two times that the golden scepter is held out. Um, and then one time in which they talk about that. So I'm not sure particularly what it means, as I've said, but I think it's something, one of those details we have to consider. Okay. So, um, so getting back to these lines, what the task is today is we are supposed to uh, finish off this line. <clears throat> and um, so if, if you, you can see here, there's a few things that I've added. So one is at Iran's suggestion um, that 384 days from Mordecai's dream to Xerxes commencing his planning to uh, you know, he's stirring up all against the realm of Grisha is 384 days. And that's two to the power of seven times three. And of course, you can see there the 273 symbol. And those are occurring between these two way marks that we mark as 911 and 119. And, uh, and then we have the 186 days to Vashti being deposed, which we mark as July 18th. And then I've laid out these other dates and we need to figure out i mean i placed the way mark there so i'm saying esther's wedding is the second angel arriving haman's decree is a formalization but more particularly i don't know if it's it's haman's decree that's the formalization 
or really Esther having this scepter, the golden scepter placed upon her neck. So, so we put Haman's decree there, but see, I would be more inclined to get rid of this at all and, and have it, uh, Esther's pardon or Esther's plea, maybe. Um, so that's going to be with the golden scepter. And then that's going to be focused upon uh, the April 20th date, which makes this then um, uh, 1580 days. I'll be correct there. So, um, so that's the 1580. You can see that there in this chart below from 420 to December 22. 479. You have an extra eight there. What's that? I have an extra. Uh, you put 1588. Oh. Yeah, 1580. Okay, good, thanks. Now, of course, that's going to uh, match up with these 66 days, um, as you can see. So if I get the 1580 and then the 66 days, so that matches up. Now, um, and then we have 256 days to the decrees going in, in effect. Now, um, so, so this is going to be uh, Esther's plea. And 66 days later, Esther's decree is set. So both of these have a golden scepter attached to them. Uh, so not quite exactly in that. So that's the 16th day. Uh, she's going to have the golden scepter. You know, maybe I should have a little picture of a golden scepter. And then Esther's decree is also connected with the golden scepter. So, um, and then we have to figure out what these are in our line. So, so this is what I'm, I'm happiest with. Now, uh, one of the things about this, we know that this decree here is, is issued on the 23rd day of the third month. That's the month Sivan, um, in the 12th year of Xerxes. And that's June 25th, 474. And it's the 25th day of the sixth month. And it's 256 days to the decree going in effect. Um, but also, um, since it's the 23rd day of the third month, this is 323 inclusive days from Esther's plea to the decree going in effect. So we got this 256 and the 323 represented here. That one just happens to be inclusive. This one is not. Because if you added 66 plus 256, you'd see you get 322. But I'm just looking at it inclusively. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully uh, this makes sense. Now, um, so one of the things about, about this whole study is we're using apocryphal Esther. So we're using this story of Mordecai's dream at the beginning of this. Now, the 384 days, as, as we noted, uh, two to the power of seven times three. So that's a symbol of 273. Now it could be the third month, the 27th day. It should be, could be three times two to the power of seven, which would be the day following March 26th, 44. So, there's this sort of movement in time there. And then we have the story, of course, of chapter one, Xerxes planning, Vashti deposed. But in that story, we're going to take Esther's wedding as then the arrival of the second angel. So we're going to have Xerxes planning is this formalization of this message that comes with Mordecai's dream. That is, we would have to understand how this is. What what is the darkness? What is the message? Um, and what these events have to do with the formalization and empowerment of that message. We've placed them in our time as 9-11, 11-9, and 7-18. And then we have to do the same with the second message. Right? So, so we're not just really taking the, 
like chapters one, two, and three, and putting them as these three messages. Even though we're saying that's true about the story of Esther, we're actually going all the way to the decree going in effect with this line. And um, we know that there is this unresolved issue between Saul and Agag that, that has continued for 609 years up until Mordecai's dream. Right. So Mordecai's dream is going to be 609 years after. If we have the right date for that, you know, there's dispute about what date exactly uh, when that occurs. But I have 609 years just based upon the 400 years of Ellen White's statement on how I interpret it. Stephen suggested another way to interpret it. Um, but I'm going to take that, that that's in what the third year of Saul. Uh, that we're going to be counting that from, if I remember correctly, because um, we got 484 plus 609 brings us to, so it's going to be the fourth year of Saul, uh, 1093 uh, BC, that we're counting that 609 years from. <clears throat> Now, um, dealing with the Apocrypha, I spent a great deal of time reading about Apocryphal Esther, um, like understanding what the criticisms are. So basically, scholarship, they always want to place everything in the second century BC, all of this sort of apocryphal literature and so forth. Some of them put it a bit later that these emendations to the book of Esther occurred. Uh, there is There is evidence that the rabbinic Jews definitely accepted apocryphal Esther. They had problems with the book of Esther because they felt that it was uh, the fact that it doesn't mention God, like the Hebrew version of it, uh, bothered them. Um, but we have this in account where this book has been translated from the Hebrew into Greek within the book of Esther itself. And, and to me, that seems like a reasonable uh an account that, that that's what happened. This book from some Hebrew original was translated into Greek, not like the original writing of the book of Esther, but some Hebrew document, some copy of Esther that included these references to God. And um, that in some way, the book of Esther, my, my view is that it possibly was secularized, that, that the references to God were removed from the book rather than being added to the book. But we cannot prove any of this, right? So it's, it's merely speculation. Um, what we can say, though, is that we can take this book and we can place it on a line. We can take Mordecai's dream and see that it's one year prior to Xerxes' planning. It gives us that first day of the first month symbol, which I think is important. And the fact that it tells us it's the first of Nisan in the second year of Xerxes is it's not some arbitrary date. Um, it's a very specific date, this first of Nisan, which seems significant. Like um, It's not like the date that you would most likely think somebody just making something up would choose. Um, there's lots of other dates that they, they could have used. You know, they could have used the 13th day of the 12th month of the first year of Xerxes or something like that. Right. Uh, we also know that in this book they call him Artaxerxes. And we do know that there was a confusion later uh, regarding um, Xerxes, who he was. That is, he was confused with um, Artaxerxes, and that shows up in this apocryphal Esther. But that could merely be just in translating from the document. That is, the document might have said Ahasuerus, and they just translated that as Artaxerxes. So the Hebrew original that it was translated from probably said Ahasuerus. But, you know, we can't prove that, though we do know um, uh, something similar in some of the apocryphal esters have Ahasuerus, not Artaxerxes. 
so anyway, we, we have this, this book with the Apocrypha portions of it and we can lay it on a line and it makes sense. Uh, it makes sense the first day of the first month as being a symbol of 9-11 and that's where we're going to place it. We're going to start this line at 9-11. But 11-9 being the formalization of that, that fits in what we've, what we've understood in, um, uh, studying judges. Now we have Xerxes planning there, right? And it's just, we have that 186 days. So the 187th day as being July 18th, um, as a symbol, right? Not literally between those two dates, but just as a symbol. Um, and, uh, Vashti being deposed. Now this is the, so we have this, so we know that we're looking at this in our history as addressing Trump. So, so if we're going to take Mordecai's dream as 9-11, what is the period of darkness that's being addressed in our history that symbolized this conflict between Saul and Agag and Mordecai and Haman? What would be the darkness? I know we... You know, we got a few people here. So we have 9-11. It's a way mark in our history. We have this conflict. So Saul and Agag, Mordecai and Haman. And this conflict is existing at 9-11. And uh, so Mordecai's dream represents, <coughs> it's a symbol of something connected with 9-11. So what is his dream? It's this conflict between these two dragons, one being Mordecai, one being Haman. This conflict that's left over. So what is that conflict symbolically? Anybody have ideas of what that would mean? No, Angela has a comment regarding the scepter, which we'll probably come back to at some point. Um, Stephen, do you have any ideas about this? I mean, I know you're not a fan of, uh, of some of the things I've said here as far as is Mordecai's dream valid or not, or at the timing of the 609 years. But can it represent something? Let me not say that it represents the great controversy. Okay. So it represents the great controversy, right? Because, because of the symbolism. So what is the great controversy issue at 9-11 that this movement is addressing? What is, what is this story supposed to be illustrating? So, so I agree. It's the great controversy. That's what we said. But now, how is this? How is this connected to 9/11 and to this line? So, so the United could, States. Yeah. The United States is represented as the dragon in Revelation 13, verse 11. Okay. So we know that it, it speaks as a dragon of the Sunday law. Mm -hmm. And we see 9-11 as a type of the Sunday law. In the sense okay. Uh, so, so this is an important point. We know that this is really about the Sunday law. And if we look at this movement prior to 9-11, the movement is looking for the Sunday law. Correct. That's what Jeff in the, in the 1990s, Jeff, like all Seventh Day Adventists, is looking for signs of the coming Sunday law. Then something happens unexpectedly, suddenly and unexpectedly, an event occurs that wakes up Seventh Day Adventists. I mean, we're we're all very startled by it. It's not something that we were expecting. 
correct? So the Sunday law, in a sense, did spring upon us suddenly, but we, we weren't able to recognize what it was. Now, some Adventists, like myself, were drawn to Testimonies 9-11. And in Testimonies 9-11, we're going to have, starting on Testimonies line, page 11, of uh, this story of whatever it is, the last crisis. Um, we can always get the title wrong. Um, now, it's a whole section there in um, in the spirit of prophecy. So there's a, for the coming of the king. So it's about the second coming. It's the last crisis. So the last crisis is going to describe the story in chapter 12 or page 12. It's going to start talking about uh, what this vision she had uh, when in New York City, right? Of these buildings rising story after story, right? All that stuff that we then associate with 9-11 with the events of 9-11. But we know that um, at first, this movement doesn't recognize what this event is. It takes us time, and then we eventually attach to it uh, Revelation 18, so that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down at 9-11. Now, Ellen White would see this angel of Revelation 18 as being more connected to the Sunday law itself but we see that there is some things there about the Sunday law. One is the Patriot Act that's put into force because of 9-11 that changes from uh, common law to Roman law, that you're in, guilty until proven innocent instead of innocent until proven guilty. We see with the church the acceptance of spiritual formation as a requirement of our ministers. In order to become ordained ministers, they have to take this uh, spiritual formation course to satisfy the accreditation of the Protestant churches. Um, why why we have to do that, I have no idea. It doesn't really make any sense because they don't really care about us anyway. Um, so, so we have those types of things occurring. So, so the darkness there has to do with the Sunday law itself. So that means this story of Xerxes, which is Trump, is going to be giving us information about the Sunday law. Right? That's why we're studying Esther. And we can see that that's what's being addressed. And so 9-11 and 11-9 are going to address that. Now, when we get to 11-9, uh, this movement has this major division between Parminders. I mean, before we had ministries leaving FFA, you know, leaving that leaving that association. But now we have the first major split in FFA itself, right? And and we we place that at eleven nine. So no, you know, November ninth, two thousand nineteen, or not two thousand nineteen. Uh, um, 20, yeah, 2019. I said that right. <laughs> okay, so not 1989 because we have an 11.9 in 89, but we have 11.9 in 19. And so that um, is also symbol by, symbolized by the first day of the first month. Now, so Xerxes planning is, um, now, now part of what we do with uh, November 9th is we also associate this with the beginning of the pandemic, right? So, um, so in this history, in 2019, we know that the pandemic uh, begins in connection with November 9th. Now, it's going to take time for this to develop, and um, so in this this period of time from November 9th to July 18th. It's going to be a period of 252 days, but we have this symbol here of 186. The 186 or the 187 and the 252 are connected together. One is we know that um, 
7 times 18 times 20 is 2520. And so, so we know that that's connected. But we also know that the 186 days or 187 inclusive days is a symbol of July 18th as well. So July 18th is connected to the 2520. Now the period of time um, uh, that we have here in Xerxes is from the 180 days and the seven days. So, so it's 187 days. We just have it there as 186. But I'm going to do this. I'm just going to change this chart a little bit and address this other point that is that we really haven't addressed in de detail. So if I go 187, let's, oops, uh, 187. There we go. And I just put the I there. That just means inclusive, right? Now, from, um, now this period here, this 3,291 inclusive days, that's going to go to the 13th. So that goes to the 13th day of the first month in the uh, 12th year. Okay, I guess we gotta go like this. There we go. Yeah, so that's going to be um, what, what I'm adding together here, just so you can see this clearly, is I'm taking 187 plus 1527 plus uh, 1577. And that's going to give me 3,291 days. So what's the significance of 3291? Where does that come from? Anybody remember? Uh, was that something to do with the 777 chiasm? Yes. Okay. So if we count from... Uh, the Mayan calendar date, the beginning of the 13th Baktun, right? 13.0.0.0.0 days, right? That's in their count, their long count calendar. That's the day the world's supposed to end, December 21st, 2012. And we count to December 25th, 2021. Uh, we're going to get 3,291 days. Okay, so that means what I would do, just because of that symbol, I would put this in our history as um, December 25th, 21, right? I probably could put these other 20. So three, so you can get uh, uh, 391 out of there and a half, I guess, Iran is saying with that 3291. Um, I'm just putting these here just to clarify these so that we know what they are. Okay. Um, now, the other thing is between July 18th, uh, 20, and December 25th, 2021, uh, we have a period of 525 days, right? Now, that's part of that 777 structure. You've got the 252 and uh, the 525. Now, between these two dates, though, in Esther's history, we have 3,108 days. Now, that's an inclusive count. So I'm going to the 16th to April 20th. 
Um, I need to put this here too. Showing that it's to that date. But this is to this date, right? Now, what's the significance of 3108? Uh, is it half of one five five four? Uh well, yes. And that is, um, you divide out the seven, and it's is it uh, two twenty or something? I can't remember exactly what it is. Okay, uh, two twenty two divided by so seven times. 222 is 1554. But I think the bigger significance is um, 3108 divided by 4 is 777. Right? That is, uh, we have in that uh, chiasm of the 3,291 days from December, 20, uh, December 21st, 2012 to December 25th, 2021. Uh, we have four different periods of 777 days separated by 183 days in the center. But so 3,108 is simply 777 times four. Okay, does that, that make sense, Stephen? Yes. Okay. So it, it's just another thing that connects us to our history to the 777 structure. Uh, that, you know, here we have these two dates in our history that we're marking. This formalization is Esther's plea. Um, and then we have this 308 days inclusive count. Then we have this 3,291 days inclusive count. And it's tying together uh, in that history these numbers to dates on our line. Now, um, so the first day of the 10th month in, in the seventh year, um, this one here, Esther's wedding, we have to give a waymark in our history that addresses that. So, so the first day of the 10th month, the significance there has to do with this divorcement, right? But, but we don't, we haven't really, you know, so we have to figure out what that date is. So the first day of the 10th month is, is the symbol for Esther's wedding. But what is that date in our history? What event is being marked there that we would say is the arrival of the second message in our history? So in this line, relating to the first message is relating to this issue of the great controversy between Christ, Christ and Satan, specifically in connection with the Sunday law, as it relates to Adventists. And this first three messages are addressing that. Um, so Xerxes planning and Vashti being deposed. This is the woman who refuses. So there's a refusal uh, to accept the call. And now we have a second message, which is about a woman who does accept the call. And so what, it, what event in our history would we mark as the arrival of the second angel? What is that message? And how is it going to relate to uh, these other waymarks? Okay, well, it can't be the first day of the 10th month can't be the 10th Telford Muse camp meeting because we're looking at events before December 25th, 2021. So somewhere between July 18, 2020 and December 25th, 2021, we have a way mark that, that needs to be placed there. And um, so, you know, what is that way mark going to be?
It doesn't have to be a literal date in our history or anything. Now, the interesting thing about our history, if we looked at the first day of the 10th month in 2021, that is, um, that is three days before December, uh, let me see here, December 25th, 2021. No, that's, pardon me, that's not gonna work. That's gonna be after. Um, I'm not sure how to do this. So the first day of the 10th month in 2021 is going to be, um, oh, I'm looking at the wrong year. This is why. Okay. So let me see. That doesn't make sense. Okay. So here, here's a better way to look at this. Uh, so we're not going to look for the first day of the 10th month in between here. But we have a, a date that's symbolized. So the date that's being symbolized is the divorcement. Here it's actually a wedding, right? Um, so when does that divorcement begin or when do they decide about it? So we know that this date here on the biblical calendar in 2021 is the 20th day of the ninth month. Right. So we're going to have here, uh, just going to write here, 20th day, ninth month on our calendar. You know, so it's it's obviously not the 16th day of the first month on our calendar that we're marking. We're marking the 20th day of the ninth month. And. Um, And we have here, do it this way. Um, I mean, this is the 26th day of the fourth month. I'm just going to put these in here just. Now, here in this history, if we're going to mark it as some date, um, what would be the date that we would want to have? Not that we want to have, but what, what date would be significant as marking the arrival of the second message? Anybody have any ideas? I mean, we got things like December 6, 2020. We got, um, you know, December 25th, 2020, the bombing of Nashville. We have uh, the siege of Washington in, in 2021, 20, uh, January 6th, 2021. I was considering the December 6th of 2020. Okay. And I would say so too, right? And, and here's why. So if we put December, we know that the biblical date here is the 20th day of the ninth month, right? But they, they picked this, this date that was connected to, uh, you know, it's, it's the 12th month, the sixth day, so the 126 there. And we also know that um, uh, that that's going to be end up being the 20th day of the ninth month on the biblical calendar. So they they picked the perfect date, one biblical year uh, prior to um, December 25th, 2021, right? And and if you look at those two dates. How many days apart are they? All right, so 
So remember over here, we have a year, first day of the first month, the first day of the first month, they're 384 days apart. So if we look at this in our calendar between these two dates, so I'm going to put it underneath here, copy this. How many, how many days is it from uh, December 6th, 2020 to December 25th, 2021? Is it a leap year? I believe it is a leap year. Yeah, so it's a leap year. You can see that because it's not less than a year. It's more than a year. Okay. So if we're on December 26th, 2020, and um, we count 384 days, we get that symbol that we have at the beginning of this line. So 384 days is uh, 2 to the power of 7 uh, times 3. So we have that already at the beginning of this line, right, with between uh, the Nissan 1 in the second year of uh, Xerxes and then uh, the first day of the first month in the third year of Xerxes, right? So we have that same symbol here. So, so the fact that we have this symbol here on this line and we know that that's when they meet to decide about the divorcement. So we can see how this is internally within this movement addressing these conflicts that are occurring within the movement. Right, the division that happens. So we have nine eleven, and then we have eleven nine. At eleven nine, we have the first major division in this movement. That is, it's not just ministries separating from the movement; it's the movement itself splitting into two things that we call the Alpha and the Omega. Right. Right. And then we have eighty seven days, symbolically in the story of Xerxes, from the planning to Vashti being deposed, and we're saying that, that this is representing the, the first we have symbolized with Trump, uh, because we know that that's part of that history. Um, so Xerxes planning to stir up all against the realm of Grisha, that's happening externally, and we're also knowing that that's addressing this pandemic. When we get to July 18th, this movement is there's a group within this movement that's acting like Vashti. That is, they're refusing, right? And now they're refusing. Uh, what is it that they're refusing symbolically? Symbolically, they're refusing to stand up and be counted. Right. And now Vashti is being asked to appear naked before these guests. So that's obviously a bad thing. But in the context of the gospel, we are to stand naked before God. Right? Correct. Okay. Because we need to have our deeds exposed. And the movement doesn't want that. They want to see themselves as righteous. They don't want to see themselves as sinners. They, they stand in self-righteousness against the world, believing that that is the proper stance, that, that they need somehow to, to be vindicated, to be proven correct. That's a problem with Seventh-day Adventists. And, and so we're Seventh-day Adventists, we're Laodiceans. We're like that. We, we, we're rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. That's what we think. We don't really realize that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay. So that's July 18th. And, and this, this is then when we get to December 6th, 2020, 
we have this second angel arriving and um uh and, and, and we're putting that there because, you know, we have this is the next date given in the book of Esther, right? So, so we're just giving the dates that are given in the book of Esther. It's going to be the first day of the 10th month that she's married. And so, so we have to look in our line and say what date is going to fit there. Definitely December 6th is going to fit there as this second angel arriving. And it's going to be formalized. One biblical year later, 384 days later, two to the power of seven times three days later, um, on December 25th, 2021. Now, of course, that's going to be Esther's plea on April 20th, 474. And we're marking that date rather than uh, the date that um, uh, Haman issues the decree. We're counting the three days later. Uh, for the simple reason that the golden scepter is is held up for Esther um, on that date. And then it's going to occur 66 days later again that the golden scepter is held out. Um, and that's when the decree is issued, what we call Esther's decree, on the 23rd day of the third month. So, so that June 25th, 474 B.C. And so we're just connecting those golden scepters, Esther's plea and Esther's decree as the formalization and empowerment. That's Boston and Exeter. That's midnight and the midnight cry uh, symbols. And then we have the 256 days. Now, um, that's two to the power of eight days um, uh, until the de decree goes into effect. But it's also interesting when we're dealing with this between Esther's wedding and Esther's plea that 384 at two to the power of seven times three. Yeah, 273. Yep, yeah, gives us that number that we've looked at as being Levites. Right. So we have the message to the Levites. And we have this at the beginning with Mordecai's dream and Xerxes planning too. Correct. So. Um, you know, so we, we can just see that this symbol shows up again and it helps affirm uh, where we've placed these um, these numbers, plus, you know, the 308 days and then, of course, the 3291 days. Of course, that's going to go to the 13th day of the first month of the 12th year. So so we have in there this sort of three days um, that's mentioned regarding uh, uh, when the decree of Haman is issued and Esther makes her first plea, right? So, so we can mark that in our history, but now we have Esther's decree. So we got up to December 25th, 2021, but now we have Esther's decree. So this is a counter decree. And, and we know that on December 25th, 2021, in the formalization of this message, Colin is going to present. Uh, so there's lo lots of things that happen, but one of them is that Colin presents this prediction about Trump having to be reelected or put back into place to bring in the Sunday law, and that that we failed in understanding the the Trump prediction that he's the last president of the United States, and so we were, we expected. Oh, sorry. Okay, so yeah, somebody's trying to contact me, and we're still in a meeting here. So, so we're still in a meeting. Just contact me later. Okay, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so here we have um, we have this issue with Trump that's being uh, presented on December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. So now we have this second angel empowered, and we're going to have this date, uh, the third month, the 23rd day. 
Now, what's the significance of that that date? Is is there any significance that of it that we have beyond this? Is it apply in any way to our history? Uh, what does it mean? How how are we going to find what Esther's decree is in our history? We know it's the empowerment of a message that was formalized on December 25th, 2021. And, and that message arrived December 6th, 2020. So this is about a woman that is going to accept the call. So a church that's going to accept a call. So what do we do with this? How do we address this? Because I don't have the answer to it. Anybody have ideas? We're just going to be stuck here. Okay, so Iran says uh, the second month, 20, 23 days, but we got the third month in 23 days. I'm saying it, it can represent two months and 23 days. Oh, 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 so, but it's, okay, explain, so that is the number 3777? Because when you're, that's measured from the start of the year, if you're just measuring it as a span. Oh, okay, so if you're counting the third month, the 23 days, it's two months and 23 days, and that's the complement of 777, that is if, you add 777 plus 223, you get 1,000, right? <clears throat> so that's what we call a complement. Um, there's other types of complements that can that can occur as well. In a sense, you know, 434 and 343 are complements of 777, right? Um, okay, anything else? I mean, other compliments like the speed of light is uh, if you take 187,000 miles per second and you subtract 718, which is July 18th, you get the speed of light. So those other types of compliments. But so how does that help us then in understanding this, uh, where we're going to place this way mark? So we've come up to J December 25th, 2021. We're saying that is... Because of the three two nine one days, it's going to have to be uh, um, the way mark of December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, ending that line of the the, the chiasm. So. So what do we do then? So we have something that's the empowerment of this message. What would we look for as the empowerment of it? It's 
It's under Esther's decree, so it's a counter decree, right, in chapter 8 of Esther. Here, let's, let's go look at this, see if we can figure out from the chapter the symbols themselves. Okay, on that day did King Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jew's enemy, unto Esther the queen. So we know that Haman's been hanged. Um, and Mordecai came before the king, and Esther had told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. And Esther spake yet again before the king, and fell down at his feet, and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. Okay. Um, so, so these first four verses, what do we have? The second time that Esther is appearing before the king. Okay, right. So the second time. And since so the second time the golden scepter is held out. Okay, so what else? What is this? Is giving us any help in understanding what this is in our history? Because this is a type of pardon, right? Well, we have been addressing that Esther is a message, right? Yeah. So my question is, is this portion from Esther 8 more applicable to a point later in the line rather than the point where, where it's being placed right now? No. So, so I understand what you're saying, but you're you're confusing different lines that we're doing. Okay. No, I'm just so, I'm I'm bringing a point out for discussion. That's all. Right. But but in in doing that, what I'm saying is that um, we have we this line that we've created that that we've we've fleshed out is simply the line of the chronology that's given in the Book of Esther. Right. That's that's what we've done. Okay. Take in the book of Esther, and these are the dates that have been given to us either directly or indirectly. Okay, so now we said, well, we can put these dates on a line, and we have seven of them, and, and so we could lay them out as way marks, and then we marked what the events are, and then we've used the symbols here as first we're saying that there is. is um, uh, we know that we're going to have this, this first message that's going to address the issues of the Sunday law, because that's part of what the darkness is prior to 9-11. This movement has been looking for the Sunday law like Seventh-day Adventists have. When 9-11 comes, we see the start of the Sunday law, and, and that message is going to be developed and then formalized on November 9th, 2019. Right? At that time, um, we have Xerxes, who is, we haven't dealt with the symbolism so much. We know Mordecai and Haman have to do with this conflict between Saul and Agai. This is this unresolved controversy that represents the great controversy. So that's going to represent the Sunday law. And so for 609 years, that, that controversy has been raging. And now we come to the time when the Sunday law is going, period is going to commence. So that's 9-11. And we have this symbol of the message to the Levites going to November 9th, 2019. So the message is then formalized. But we're saying it's going to be empowered when Vashti is deposed. That is, that's the woman that refuses to, to accept the call, the church that refuses to accept the call. And so those that reject the July 18, 2020 message they're going to be deposed symbolically on that date. Now, of course, 
some people it's going to happen later. So it's not so much about the time of, of what, what's happening with individuals. This is just what the line is symbolizing. And then we, we had these two different ways in which we came to the fact that because of the, the span of time between Xerxes planning the first day of the first month in his third year to the 16th day or the 13th day of the first month in his 12th year as being 3,291 days that we, we have to say, well, this is part of our structure that's going to end on December 25th, 2021. So we're going to have to take that date and line it up there. And then we, we worked to get that center date because of the symbolism of it, even though it's the first day of the 10th month, it's connected to the 20th day of the ninth month. So December 6, 2020 is going to be connected to that uh, uh, December 22nd, 479. Even though they're different dates, that symbol is there. And then it gives us the 384, just like at the beginning of this line. So, so then we have the symbol for the Sunday law, 66 six, instead of 666, six, six, to Esther's decree. Well, this is the counter decree. And then we have to figure out what, what is that representing? So this isn't so much about Esther here being a message. Because when we're looking at uh, Esther 1, 2, and 3, chapter 1 is the first message, chapter 2 is the second, chapter 3 is the third message, just like in Daniel 1, 2, and 3. But here we're dealing with Esther now representing the church that accepts the call. So, so that means there has to be uh, an empowerment of that when the church accepts the call. And, and so we'd have to figure out what date that is from December 25th, 2021. So now we have this counter decree uh, the third month, the 23rd day, so we have that symbol, it's the 12th year. Uh, we have June 25th um, in their calendar in 474. So, so what does this connect us to? Does, does it help us in any way to place what way mark, not what the way mark is, because it's going to be the second angel in power, but what what way mark that is in our history in connection with what we see here. So we have lots of different dates that we could choose from since December 25th, 2021, but we want to choose the right date. And then we know that the decree goes into effect on a certain date, and we need to know what that is. So we know it's March 7th, 473. In, in that story, it's the 13th day, of the 12th month of the 12th year. Right. Of course, if you multiply those together, you get 1872. So what do we do with this? That's what I'm asking. I don't have the answer to it. I'm just set it up. Does that help, Dwight? A little bit. Okay. I mean, so, um, you know, we have these, these symbols. We have the 323 inclusive days. We have the 66 days and the 256 days to the power of eight and six, six. Can, can we place those in our history? Do we have enough knowledge to say when, what is the empowerment of this message um, of the woman that accepts the call? I mean, maybe it's not a date in our history. Maybe it's just some event that's still future. But we would look at the symbols here. Now, when it comes to Esther's decree, so I want to look at the scriptures a bit more themselves. So we know that um, he holds out the golden scepter the second time. And, and then she says, um, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in thy sight, and the things seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite. Now we know... They can't change the law of the Medes and the Persians. So, so they're going to figure out a strategy here. And um, um, so then were the kings, uh, so it says here, write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name 
and seal it with the king's ring, for the writing which is written is the king's name and sealed with the king's ring. May no man reverse. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is the month Sivan, in the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies, the rulers of the provinces, provinces which are from India, unto Ethiopia, etc., etc. And he wrote in the king, and he wrote in the king Ahasuerus's name, and sealed it with the king's ring. And they sent letters by posts on horseback, and riders on mules, and camels, and young dromedaries. At, wherein the king granted the Jews which were in every city to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish all the power of the people and province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and take the spoil out of them for a prey. Upon one day in all the provinces of the king of Hazarus, namely on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and the copy of the writing for commandment to be given in every province was published, unto all people, and that the Jews should be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies, right? So this is going to be the decree that's given. And um, is there anything in here that can, because this is the giving of the decree. This isn't the inaction of the decree. This is just when the decree is given. So is there anything here that gives us some clues as to what this decree is symbolizing in our lines? Or are we stuck? Because I, I don't like guessing. <clears throat> So, so we brought up to to Colin's prediction, and, and remember that he's going to have this structure that's a prophetic mirror structure that's going to bring us to uh, January eleventh, twenty twenty three. But does that fit with Esther's decree? What do you mean, fit? I'm looking at the situation that, that has been ongoing for most of the last couple of years, where both the Canadian group and the American group want to go off on either studies that are trying to apply things too literally or going back over studies that have all been already been fairly well established. Okay. So when you were looking at, at this with, with Collins' study, mm -hmm. while I agree that there has been some light from this, is this also not establishing for us the fact that there are many that are just refusing to consider the light that's been coming from these studies. Yeah. Well, see, that's see, that's the problem. So we had some light given to us on December 25th, 2021. But instead of examining the light in in the context that we we make mistakes and trying to understand 
what mistakes we, we've made compared to the Millerites. We, we took that light and tried to force it into our preconceived ideas about what was happening. Right. And really, it's preconceived ideas about ourselves, because really, it's all about we're not wrong. I mean, that's my view of it. It's like, we're not wrong. We're right. Well, but we're not right. Because we were wrong. And we were wrong about how we saw July 18th and how we saw Trump, his role. But if we're going to say, well, no, Trump still has to fulfill his role. Because remember, the issue with December 6th, what was happening at that time, was they had rejected the symbolic use of dates. And now there were still some there holding on to, well, Trump's still going to retain power. He has to retain power. I mean, if our prediction regarding Trump is wrong, then this whole movement is wrong, right? That's that's the types of things that were being said at that time. Right. We had the election a month before, and you know, it was still uncertain about what direction it was going to go. Um, even though you know Biden had been declared a winner, maybe something could be shown that was going to. Uh, you know, there's a miscount or something, right? All those things were going on in December 6, 2020. How, how is that different from those at the Millerite time that continued to point to other dates for Christ's return? Right. So we studied early writings, page 74 at that time. Right. In that history. And we could see definitely the parallel uh, dealing with Sister Minor and also uh, Samuel Snow and his direction that he had taken. So, so we had people setting dates, uh, people who accepted October 22nd as valid, but still were setting dates, right? So you had lots of different groups of people accepting certain parts of the message. Um, you know, you had Joseph Bates thinking, well, it's going to be seven years from October 22nd, 1844. And of course, because they didn't understand the calendar properly, they're going to look at November of, of uh, uh, 1851 as the end of the, uh, the period of time, right? So, so that they're pretty mixed up in some of their ideas. And then, of course, you have Sister Minor uh, mixing up literal and spiritual, wanting to go back to old Jerusalem and build it up as if it had something to do with uh, you know, the second coming of Christ. So, so we have all of this confusion in that history. And, and in this movement, that's the reality. I mean, the reality is people, people want not to be wrong. So they want to be right, right? Um, and, and there's all this division. There's all this pulling in different directions. But God is giving a very specific direction of what they're supposed to do. And what they were supposed to do was study together. Ellen White's group, as an example, to, to us today, spent the time in prayer and study. When there was differences, they went away, they came back, and they looked at those at, at what they were studying openly and honestly. And sometimes when they could move no further, they consulted, you know, God did. God had Ellen White go into vision and solve some problems for them. But the point is they were moving together in unity. They weren't pulling apart. And, and that's what should have happened on December 25th, 2021. The movement should have pulled together, said, okay, Colin presented some wonderful things. How are we going to study this together? You know, Instead, it was set up as, even before Colin presented, uh, this sort of debate between Theodore and Colin. That, you know, Colin was told, Theodore's not going to like what you're going to share, uh, which isn't true. There's, there's nothing about what Colin said that I didn't like. I just knew that there were some things that we had studied that showed that it doesn't have to be Trump. And at that time, that's all I knew. I didn't know, I didn't know 
the arguments. I couldn't say, well, Colin's wrong and here's why, which is what people are saying I should have been able to do. But I couldn't do that because I didn't know that he was wrong. I just knew that we had some light that showed that it might not be Trump, that it doesn't have to be Trump. And, and that is, I knew that we were in this zoomed in history and that wh whatever our history was, it was typical of something that was going to happen. That Trump was his, these events of the pandemic and all this were types. And so they couldn't be the actual thing. Doesn't mean it couldn't be Trump in the end, but I'm just saying it doesn't have to be Trump because all kinds of things could happen that we can't foresee. But they, they wouldn't even allow that, that that discussion go on. And, and the fact that I'd already been shut out from the American group and I've been shut out from the Canadian group, not in any official way, at least with the American group, they sent me a letter saying, you're never presenting here again. But with the Canadian group, they've never done that. But definitely, I never presented again. And, and you know, the attitudes that people have about me are hindering this movement, and they should never have happened. But because this isn't about me, this is about the light that God has been giving this movement, and we can make it about people and reject light just because of our personal preferences or whatever you want to call them. And, and that is not of God. So we know that that's not correct. But if we're going to take this, so we know the problem that exists within the movement, that we have light, it's been rejected. Um, and so there has to be a group that has accepted this light. That is, there has to be in this line, we have, the woman, the church that refused the call, and now we have the church that has accepted the call. And, and that has to be this movement. But the question is, do we have a date in which we can mark that? Now, so when we look at Esther's decree itself, we try to figure out what is it symbolizing? Well, there's something else going to happen in the future, some kind of conflict, right? And God's people need to be armed for that conflict. Now, we know that that conflict is the Sunday law, right? It's March 7th, right? We, we know as Seventh-day Adventists that, that that's the Sunday law, correct? That has to be the conflict that's being talked about, that's symbolized here as March 7th, 473. So we can just simply say that this is the Sunday law. It's not a date that we can place on our line. We don't know when the Sunday law is going to be. Okay, does that make sense to people? And so the thing is, what's going to equip us to defend ourselves in the Sunday law. Because that's Esther's decree. So what is it? Can it be marked on our lines as some kind of a date or some kind of an event? Do people get what I'm saying here? I'm considering carefully what you're saying. So we have some something between, you know, December 25th, 2021, and the Sunday law. And it's called Esther's Decree. I mean, this is the woman that has accepted the call, and there's an empowerment that occurs prior to the Sunday law. We call it the midnight cry, right? So in this line, we have a symbol of the midnight cry. We can all agree with that. So what is that?
<clears throat> and if, if we go back to, to um, December 6, 2020, so we know they issued their declaration. But that's obviously the declaration is not the second message. Now, we're knowing that Esther's wedding is symbolizing a divorce proceedings. Right? Because it's on the first day of the 10th month. And that December 6th is going to be addressing that, um, like Ezra chapter 10, where it talks about they gathered together on the 20th day of the ninth month to confess their sins. And they're gathering together. It's during this time of this great rain. because It's the rainy season in Jerusalem. And so that 20th day of the ninth month in, uh, you know, 457, that, that's this important date. It symbolizes also December 25th, the Sunday law itself. So we know this is about preparation for the Sunday law. So I don't know if I can can give you a date when Esther, Esther's decree is given. What we can know is that it's some event that is is counter to the Sunday law. So it's the midnight cry message, right? We can all agree with that. Does that place then Esther's plea as being also a symbol of midnight? Right, yeah. It's a symbol of midnight because it's the second angel formalized. It's midnight. So what we're what we're talking about here, I'm again, I'm just considering points from what from what is before us. Okay. We have several events within the arrival, formalization, and the empowerment of the second angel. We have a combination of symbols occurring between the first day of the 10th month of the seventh year, mm -hmm. the 16th day of the first month of the 12th year. And by those combination of symbols, we have the 158 showing as 1580 combined with the 273 or the 384 between the wedding and the plea. Now my mind is running in a different in a different line altogether because I'm I'm having to consider the the point that we would see with Esther's first time in before the king. Mm -hmm. But this combination of symbols, as we are looking at this, especially with you know, the the lead in and the I should say the bookends of the twentieth day of the ninth month has a lot to say to us at this time symbolically. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're trying to establish, you know, what we can look at as far as this with Esther's decree. I'm just mm -hmm. I'm having to to think through what other items we may be able to apply, even if it is within a in a separate line within this portion from the arrival to the empowerment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I'm considering all those things. So.
And of course, this may be something that we may have to address again Sunday morning. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the one thing that I want to say is that, um, so we have a symbol, and and I don't know how to address it. Um, so in 2023, so so I, I'm going to say that Esther's decree applies to this year. Um, now, you know, so we could look at March 23rd instead of, you know, the third day of the uh, 23rd day of the first month. So we're going to address this on Sunday. So I have some ideas and I'm going to sort of propose uh, to people about what I think Esther's decree is that in this line, we have a symbolic midnight cry. So I'm not saying this is the midnight cry on, on Jeff's line, right? Because we obviously don't have December 25th, 2021 as midnight on Jeff's line, right? Because midnight is still future. Right. So that means the midnight cry is still future. But within this line of, of the church that accepts the call, call um, we, need we need to be able, able to, to mark, mark the fact, the fact that, that, that there's, there's a church, a church that, that is accepting the call. call. And there's, there's a church, a church that has refused, refused the call. Right. Who's ever accepted the call. That's going to be the movement that's prepared for the Sunday law. And a split has occurred in this movement. You know, and I've been fighting against that split that's occurred in this movement. But there's just a reality about what has happened in this movement. Now, if this movement could come together in our upper room experience, that would be the most wonderful thing that can happen. But based upon what I see in the lines, I sort of can't ignore it. Right. So, so we're going to look at that on Sunday. Okay. So try to address the rest of this here. Okay. So um, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for the study today. We ask that your Holy Spirit can continue uh, to work in our lives. Help us to follow and serve you in all that we do. And... Um, Continue to teach us. May your angels watch over us and bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.